Hello, and welcome to another episode of Screen Bites, our thought leader series where we learn from industry experts about the latest trends and challenges from across the conversion TV space. I'm your host, Michael Beach. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Karen Nelson Field of Amplified Intelligence. I consider Karen to be one of the most knowledgeable people in the world when it comes to measuring audience attention, and we are thrilled to have her on the show. Enjoy. All right, Karen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, let's uh, start off with an icebreaker today. Um, kind of we ask every one of our guests, you know, what was your first job and, and kind of what lessons did you take away for, from it that you applied to your career? Goodness, that's a while ago. Um, so my very first job straight out of school was uh, retail. Um, I worked in a news agent actually. Um, and I, <laughs> lessons. So what did I take forward in my career? The lesson I learned in the news agency was I remember vividly how people would line up and come and pick up their newspapers. So in our city in particular, newspaper subscriptions were in those days, I don't even know what they are now, but it was so high, like at 70% or something of the population would get a newspaper delivered or the, the local uh, news court paper delivered every day. And a lot of them would, would wait at the front and line up for it. So I remember thinking, um, at the time, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, this whole quality media, I probably didn't think of it in those days in my teens, but, um, you know, the, the, the whole quality media piece definitely is valuable. You know, people are lining up and paying for the experience of whatever's in this paper. So I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. That's one of the lessons. There's others that probably shouldn't tell you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, how'd you get your start in the media space? Um, well, interesting now, because even asking me this question, it makes me think back. Um, I, I don't know, I always just had a passion for it. And um, I was a late bloomer academically. So I kind of went quite quickly once I'd started doing university, but I didn't go to uni straight after school. I had a few years where I was just experimenting around with, you know, marketing or retail or whatever was coming along and I, I remember landing a job for cinema sales and oh my god if you've ever done door-to-door cinema ad sales that is like that is real world experience let me tell you where you're walking on main roads knocking on doors saying would you like to advertise in the local cinema so I started with that um, but I, I was always kind of enamored by the concept of um, I guess advertising and and marketing um but i i remember at that time thinking and this must have been related back to you know my experience in the news agent but i remember that my absolute ultimate job would would be working for news corp so i'm from adelaide so you know it started here um and so i remember going and getting you know ogilvy on advertising and and, and, and really sort of really trying to understand how advertising were. I don't know that you'd actually get that from that book, but, and, and anytime a little ad would come up for a sales rep in the advertiser or the Sunday mail, which the papers here, I would apply for it. And eventually I got one and uh, I got to um, management um, really fast. And I'm told was the youngest ever, um, uh, you know, advertising sales manager um, in history. <laughs> So yeah, that's my my background. Well, that's fantastic. Um, kind of before we jump in any further, uh, would you mind kind of give us a, a sense of you know the team and amplified intelligence and kind of what problem you're solving? Yeah, um, the team is is an interesting team. So there's you know probably about fifteen of us now. Um, it sort of started about five years ago. So I don't know if you know my background, but um, after working in media as a young girl and I worked for Diageo, I was brand premium brand manager for Diageo. So I did the Johnnies and the, you know, the Stolichnayers and all that sort of stuff. And um, <clears throat> after working on the, the brand side, I made a decision. By then I'd already done a few degrees. And I made a decision to do a PhD and I was fortunate enough to do a PhD with Aaron Berg Bass at the time. So and it was on media but about and I stayed there for a while because the the course the, the path that I took I was really enamored by this whole new thing called Facebook and you know YouTube what is that and so my research started to sort of morph away from legacy platforms 
and more into how does the concept of brand growth apply in new media and obviously that sort of catapulted me because I was right place right time but about five years ago um, after being technically you know a, a lecturer slash associate professor then eventually I got to professor um, I was a bit fr well very frustrated by the a uh, lack of ability to move fast in an academic world and b I was also I could see that you know the whole concept of legacy metrics was becoming quite an issue and and quite frankly I saw an opportunity to develop technology to answer questions that that old-fashioned methods can't so we're a small team um, but we punch above our weight and you know there's a mix of research we, we I left the the university to really essentially build a research um, business um, but we've really really quickly morphed into a technology business and now we have a SaaS platform <clears throat> so um, Essentially what we do is we solve for the problem that not all reach is equal and the current proxies that are out there don't cut it. We solve for the problem that CPM doesn't cut it um, and there's no way that, you know, advertisers can really tell the relative value between platform A and platform B. That's the problem we solve for. So, so we have a team of researchers still, but more of our team are technology with a focus on computer vision. So essentially we have a very deep tech system that enables us to collect data across mobile and TV, um, <clears throat> which is essentially using the cameras on those devices to film people in a crude way. Um, and then that footage then goes back to, um, you know, the, the actual um, gaze models that we've built and, and translates it to attention. Uh, and you've published, uh, you know, a significant amount of research, including you know, two fantastic books uh, that our team's obsessed with. Um, oh. One of the areas you talk about is the attention economy, you know, kind of gives an overview of that and the important learnings for the media industry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I like to give the attention economy a bit of background, if I may, because it's quite a buzz word now, but not a lot of people really understand the context and its background. So, you know, here goes, um, you know, we all know that we live in this age of extreme distraction and, you know, our capacity to process is super tiny. Um, what happens is that humans make decision shortcuts. Um, which, you know, and, and give little thought to, to, to what it is that, you know, is to avoid information overload. So give little thought to, you know, researching every single thing that comes past the desk. So, you know, the attention economy comes from the concept that, you know, taking decision shortcuts when you're an air traffic controller <laughs> or when you're driving a car is not ideal. So um, in, I think even, you know, around the World War II sort of area, there were, you know, the study of information overload sort of started there and, and what, what impact does that have on our economic and social systems? So, so really the attention economy by its nature is the study of inattention and it's, its economic or social impact. And, you know, I, I often say, you know, let's just face it team, we're in marketing, it's not the same, you know, you're not gonna die. Um, but we all know that, you know, clutter and noise is, is is causing significant inattention in our industry and it costing advertisers money. Um, so that's kind of the context of the attention economy today. So it's essentially what we do is we want to understand not only the cause of inattention, the consequences of inattention, um, but also some ethical solutions to correct it. And I just want to emphasize that. So that's really important to me. So, um, you know, the, the nature of the term attention economy can conjure up social dilemma and dark corners. Um, what we're interested in doing is actually saying, you know, where are we at in our ecosystem and how have we gotten here where there's no trust or transparency? <clears throat> you know, advertising is difficult enough, but when, you know, viewers want to block you and don't, you know, so, so how can we actually improve the system and move towards essentially a currency which you know, is quality based because that's what's missing in the market today. So, so that's the context of the attention economy. The book went a bit deeper because it kind of spoke about how did we get here? So it talks, it's been a while since I wrote it, but how, how, how did we get here? Well, you know, the world exploded in the new media space really fast. And, you know, this whole blitz scaling piece where, you know, one minute I was at a news agent and we, everyone was subscribing the old fashioned way and the next minute, 
there's three trillion users of a platform that none of us had heard of the year before. So, so it talks about that and the implications for how, you know, there's this really interesting 15 years where there were not a lot of standards or rep, um, regulations and, you know, the industries try to catch up and what does that mean when measurement is not, you know, independent and where should we move towards? And right to the end, looking at, you know, what does brand growth mean in the future? So, you know, given, you know, we're kind of more driven by algorithmic editors than journalistic editors now, you know, what does that actually mean for our choice sets? What does that mean for, you know, how we buy brands and how we're exposed to them? So it's quite a broad based book with a lot of the research that we've done more recently using the technology that we have um to understand some of the mediating variables about the cause of inattention excellent well you know kind of follow up with that a, a two-part question you know what i guess overall you know how should we be measuring media today and what are the uh kind of the core metrics if you're just getting started from shifting from impressions to to attention should, should we be tracking okay so one section in the book talks about currencies um so what i've what i do acknowledge is that a currency change is not an overnight effort. Um, I mean, you guys are US, so, you know, to get it from, you know, to, to move it from nothing to your American dollar, I think they were trading on horseshoes or something or gold or whatever it was, to get it to the first American dollar took 20 years. And I feel like we all just have to take stock that this is not an overnight thing. So what I will say to your audience is my job is helping people sort of understand what we can strive for. Um, I do believe that eventually attention could be a currency because impressions are flawed. I don't think we're there yet. So, and there's a there's there's steps to take. So, for example, um, even more recently, you know, everyone's talking about the attention CPM, which we do as well. But what I've quickly learned, so we we put a, a beta trial of our um, um, SAS platform, our attention platform out, it's now in 21 countries. And what feedback we got from that and the data that we can see is that CPM and performance is not linear. So the last thing you want to do is start to call out an attention CPM, knowing that CPMs are not equal either. So for example, two similar socials might have very similar CPMs on the surface. Um, but actually below the surface, their attention numbers are quite different. So we just can't kind of go, let's just jump on a measure that we know CPMs don't equate to value. So, so there's a little bit more work to do with that. <clears throat> Albeit, I think that could be where we end up in the end. Um, but for us, um, where I see attention at the moment is not literally kicking out what you've got, right? So, you know, all the agencies have spent millions and millions of dollars on their optimizers. <clears throat> um, and so I think reach and frequency will stay for a while. What I do think will happen is attention will be a supplementary layer, which is what we're being told. So, and that's our agenda. So we, we're sort of suggesting that the data we provide um, or any you know, attention data that's credibly collected should be used as a weighting layer against net reach. So we've kind of introduced this concept of attention adjusted net reach, which is essentially sort of saying, you know, you buy against, you know, a thousand sets of eyeballs, that's, that's your reach number. But actually what we do know is that there's very, well, potentially half of them, let's just be fair, half of them even get to see it. Um, so, you know, adjust it down based on this data, then populate that back into your systems and re, you know, calculate your GRPs and your TARPs and your OTS from there. So, so I'm kind of saying, let's take a step back, integrate attention data as a quality layer from a weighted perspective, and then, then start to integrate CPMs into that. Because what will happen is the market will start to correct itself, right? Just like unit pricing. So, um, you know, pricing is the concept that, you know, when you walk into a store, you know, all the cans are on the shelf and it gives you a litre price, a per litre price. And, and the reason why that works is because, you know, a 300 mil Pepsi in terms of its initial price point is not that different to, you know, 
a 300 mil Coke. And that's what we need to get to. We need to make sure that the CPMs or the, the, the cost of the can is relative. So then you can use the unit pricing from there. So, so that's how I see the evolution of it. Start at net reach level with an attention adjusted net reach, then integrate CPMs and sort of adjust your, your mix and also your budgeting from there. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to get into kind of, you know, five, 10 years from down the road, but does technology like yours work better for TV or mobile, or is it roughly the same for both? And I'm asking that more of, you know, as more spend shifts to digital, is that just going to naturally bring this measurement to the forefront? Or is it, if it's already, you know, good for both, it, it could happen, you know, sooner? So that's the beauty of being researchers first, commercializing it second. Right. So we've gone into the market building some technology. If I'm actually, let me explain, we're, we're a combination of three different things. We're a combination of moat in that we collect, um, you know, device based data. So, you know, we collect scroll velocity, volume, sound on, off and volume, phone orientation, pixels, spatial clutter, all that sort of stuff. So we might, we're a combination of Zoom, in essence, that we take facial footage while you're viewing the platform. And that is what goes through our machine learning models. And the third piece is we're also a video player. So we can actually pull ads out of Facebook, for example, and re replace them or overlay them with, with ads. So my point is we built this really, really deep tech for the sole purpose of being 100% fair to all platforms. So my agenda is not to call out, you know, this platform's better than that platform. I, my agenda is to say, hey, you know, where does the quality lie? And if, if you're not delivering a quality inventory, this is how you can fix that. And, and to the credit of, of many of the socials, that's where they're seeing their future. Um, but my point was, you asked me, is it better in one form or another? A big part of this fairness was to make sure that cross-platform attention measurement was absolutely as fair as absolutely <laughs> to both. The last thing you want to do, and this is the problem I see in a lot of the research that's delivered, is that you can't compare methods. So therefore, one isn't equal to the other, and then one, one suffers. So the short answer is we've built the technology where we can actually put um, remote managed devices in front of TVs that film people and the, the TV content is streamed to the television set. Um, and similarly, the mobile um, is designed around the same context in that it is, you know, are you looking straight at the ad or in the case of TV, are you looking straight at the screen? The second piece is passive. So that was active. Passive attention is you're near the ad in that you're looking on the screen, but not at the ad. For the context of TV, it's you're around the ad, but you're not looking straight at it. You're sitting there, but it can still tell that you're around it. And non-attention is the same for both, that it, you, there is no way you're looking at the ad at all because you are either out of the room or your phone can't pick up that your face is detected. So so I think the short answer is we've that's been our agenda. So we're super fussy about how similar the models are across platforms so that there's no bias towards any platform at all. Excellent. And as we look forward, you know, five, 10 years as we approach the, you know, we just started a new decade as we're kind of nearing 2030, you know, how are we going to be measuring media? In 10 years? Yeah, five to 10 years, you know. I still think the same. I, I, like I said, I, I don't see, I, I think, I think the standards, well, obviously we all know that, the standards are going to be adjusted, but I still don't think we're going to move away from the same systems that we have. I just think they'll be amplified. Um, excuse the pun, because I know that's what our business is called, but I, I think technically the systems and the, the will be amplified and, 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 and data will come in, third-party independent data will come in as a check balance. So, so I don't think it's going to change. That's my, my thinking, you know, ask me in 10 years, what the next five to 10 years will look like. But I, I really don't think at its core, the currency will change significantly other than we're all aware that it needs to change. We're all aware 
that there has to be some amendments to what we're doing to drive greater effectiveness, not efficiency, but effectiveness for the, the customers or the advertisers, because at the end of the day, you know, we have to keep them surviving for this industry to survive itself. So I look at a whole ecosystem sort of starting to kind of crank up and understand that, you know, quality delivery renders quality viewing, which gives higher CPMs, which means, you know, and it's this whole kind of circle. So what I'd suggest to your listeners, viewers, is that you have a read of Joe Marchese's work. So Joe Marchese was the president of Fox uh, Ad Sales, but before that he owned Truex and sold it to News Corp for quite a lot of money. So he's a really accomplished media guy and now runs, in fact, he runs um, uh, a VC fund called Attention Capital. Um, but he inspires me because he you know, really talks about this ethical play really deeply. It's quite a, a thing for him. And I really align to that, that, you know, it, we can't just fix one part and not expect the other to fail. We've got to really pull up the entire ecosystem and away from any social dilemma kind of negativity. You know, definitely. And one area that our team focuses on is, you know, cross-screen uh, cross planning and execution. Uh, you know, with a big focus on, getting, you know, traditional TV buyers and planners to, to think about digital, whether it's social or CTV or uh, mobile desktop and vice versa, getting, you know, digital first uh, buyers to understand TV. And we've kind of gotten around the, the reach. I think people accept that and, you know, the different sources. Um, attention and effectiveness still seems to be a challenge. You know, if you're a, a, a traditional TV buyer, uh, you know, thinking you may only get two seconds of attention on a Facebook ad, it's kind of hard to digest and vice versa. If you're digital first, that you just think we should make different creative to, to work in that environment. Um, we kind of look at this as a missing piece. Um, do you see, you know, adding attention-based metrics, even if as a secondary measure, accelerating the transition to kind of across screen planning and buying? Yes. And you know why? Because hearing you say you have to build better creative is the wrong answer to advertisers. I know you didn't say that because I'm not telling you you're wrong, but I'm just saying that's the typical response, right? So my job is to let people know that the functionality of the media is what's causing the inattention or the two seconds rather than improving creative. So in our own research, we can see that amazing creative across screens still does poorly on poor functionality based socials. So um, I think what I'm trying to say to you is that the ecosystem or our avatar or our industry is actually becoming more understanding that it's actually about the delivery than anything. So, so we're seeing a shift um, and even with this, um, you know, so a year ago I made a decision to be, a part of the solution rather than just be a research organization that delivers findings. Findings don't change stuff, right? So application does. So, you know, even what we're seeing with this platform delivery, which is what we've built, um, what it's done is there's, uh, there's actually 19 platforms that have signed up to our uh, MVP, um, but they're all crying out and going, you know, can we prove, what can we do, A, what can we do to improve delivery so what are the mediating variables but b you know can we get our data considered because we really believe that we're quality uh, delivery so so i actually think the opposite i think it's good news and bad news for tv in that i think there's going to be more competition for the quality play at the moment tv owns that and i think that advertisers are starting to realize and agencies are realizing you know that BVOD TV, um, that particularly in the year of COVID, right? So the, the, the headlines for TV have just been off the charts in positivity while the headlines for the socials have been off the charts in negativity. So I think it's a good opportunity for TV to capitalise right now. But I do think they've got to watch the tail because I think, I honestly think that everyone is starting to get it, that, you know, you've got to be able to 
make sure that if it's an advertising funded supported system like you know then you've got to make sure that these ads are delivered well so that there has an effect at the other end you know and measurement of effectiveness is getting so much um more complex you know we're not just doing recall anymore i mean that's kind of moved on <clears throat> so um complex and 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 better right so I, I think it's actually changing the ecosystem at the moment so i think you know it's exciting for tv right now i think they just have to keep innovating um you know keep keep working in partnerships to get technology um adapted to compete with those that have you know superhuman computers at the other end Absolutely. And, and you were recently nominated for uh, MediaTel's Media Leader of the Year uh, for Technology and New Media. Obviously, you know, a, a great honor. Um, kind of what part of your work do you think is resonating uh, to kind of garner this attention? Excuse the pun. Um, so <laughs> I was honored by that, to be honest. Um, I, I genuinely, which is what I sort of said before. So I genuinely think it's about the shift from you know, findings to applications. So I've always had a profile as an academic, which has been fantastic. I'm quite fortunate in that way. And, you know, it gets you up the system and you get to professor. I've been a professor now for five years. But, you know, what it doesn't do is it doesn't kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how you change a media by to improve your advertiser outcomes, right? <laughs> um, so I feel like the award was um, I was nominated as a finalist because of the application in the industry. So we're getting a lot of feedback that, you know, a, as simple as it is, this attention adjusted net reach is actually making a difference. And what, what it is doing is it's actually pushing a lot more cross media buying because, you know, if you start to reduce your gross reach by a large multiplier, it just means that you have to buy across different um, media platforms. So, so I think that's why I was nominated. That's great. And one other one other area I wanted to ask you about is the attention council. You know, who's involved and kind of what's the goal? Yeah. So it started with a bunch of like-minded. Um, you know, vendors, if you like, our, our attention vendors, there's not many of us globally um, having a beer in London about a year and a half ago saying, you know, we, we all understand what we're trying to do here and we need to drive a category, which is on the precipice, right? But we need to just nudge it. So using um, our profiles, we called upon this council and said, you know, leaders in the industry who are already on the same page like let's kind of join a group and sort of come together and 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 talk about how do we how do we foster a category in the right direction and that's where it all started but what's since happened um and rightly so is that industry folk have kind of come in and taken over so when i say industry folk um you know advertisers in particular um, and, you know, they're talking about incorporating um, media owners soon. So there's been a year and a half of kind of setting an agenda. Then, you know, um, the board is changing. So there are advertisers coming through. So the next wave will sort of drive it even more deeply. So, so its agenda is to drive awareness of the importance of attention metrics. Its agenda is to... Uh, ensure that it's done ethically um, and basically sort of rally the troops. That's really what its agenda is. Great. Well, uh, we'll get you out of here with one more question. Um, we ask everybody, you know, if you could get your whole team to read one book right now, uh, what would it be and why? Oh, I'm a bit biased. So we're going through <laughs> significant scale up pain. <laughs> Um, and excitement at the same time. So we're heading into a very interesting year for ourselves. Um, and one book that changed my life, I think, was a book called It Will Never Work by Reed Hastings. 
So Reed Hastings was the original founder and CEO of uh, Netflix. Um, he's probably, his fame has been superseded by the current CEO, but um, have to say if, if anyone, and that's, we, we, we're about to do another planning day actually. So I'll be taking pieces from that, but the way that they went about forging a category is super encouraging and you know for us as a business kind of we sort of see you know don't don't listeners quote me that we're going to be like Netflix because I get that's not but we are definitely leaders in a category that's right on the edge and I feel you know some of the steps that they did um, take you know fail fast all that kind of stuff is, is you know get your MVP out there then make change then get another one out there and get change make change yeah, I love it. So, so if I, I highly recommend that book, um, uh, it will never work. Yeah, that's the list. Well, I've really enjoyed the talk, and I, I know our community is going to uh, love the conversation. And, and uh, you know, just really appreciate your time. Thanks. It was fun. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Screen Bites. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. You can find out more about Cross Screen Media at crossscreenmedia.com. And please don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter, Stay to the Screens. You can find us on social media at Cross Screen Media. Join us next time for more insights and analysis straight from the experts.